Good morning. Good morning, University Christian Church and friends. As you can see, um, we are live this morning in our sanctuary at our church campus at 6800 Adelphi Road here in Heightsville, Maryland. It's good to be back in, in the sanctuary in this new year, even though it is just the sound tech guy and myself. But I wanted to welcome you and know that we are gathering in sacred space today, wherever that sacred space is for you, if it's your living room or your bedroom or your kitchen ta table, or maybe you're listening as you are going somewhere out and about on this, this beautiful Sunday morning. We're just grateful that you are with us and, and want you to know that wherever you are there, God is also so wherever you are, it is a sacred space where the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is prepared to move and affirm you this day. My name is Nathan Hill, and I'm the pastor here at University Christian Church. We are the church at the intersection of a loving God and diverse community. Throughout our worship time today and, and afterwards, we encourage you to go to our website at uccmd.org to sign up for our email list, to contact us using our contact form, or to, to give if you feel led to support the ministry of this community of faith as we serve and love and share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. It's so good to see you all here. And I say a hello to all of you who are saying uh, good morning in the chat. Please do so. Let us know that you're here. And if you have any prayer concerns, you can post them there as well. Please know it's public so others can see. So don't share anything private. But if you want us to pray for you or your family or for someone else in your life, let us know how. Uh, let us know that and, and know that this community is, is reading those and caring for each other. Later at the, at the end of the service, we will have a time of prayer together. Well, this day is also Dr. Uh, Dr. King weekend. We remember the ministry and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and what a relevant conversation to have. Uh, now, as much as it has been in the past, as we think about the division and the violence that we have witnessed, the uncertainty and the anxiety, and the need for us to finally finish uh, the legacy of Dr. King and create a society and a world where all may flourish and thrive. And so we, uh, we hope that you are, are open and to hear the words uh, of Scripture today, as well as prayers and words of wisdom from Dr. King's legacy. And also a reminder, this afternoon there is a, a celebration, a service as a region. We gather with other churches and we'll have an online worship time to celebrate the legacy of Dr. King and challenge each other, continue our ministry and you can find out information about that online. It's not too late to register or you can go to cccadisciples.org, cccadisciples.org. So again, good morning. It's great to see all of you here, especially you, Freddie and Sylvania and Sarah and Bob and Keith and Sarah and Harriet. Good morning. Good morning from family in Oklahoma. Uh, for Margie, good morning to you and the Matigas and so many others. What a gift it is to be together for worship. Let us center ourselves and begin to ground each other in the spirit uh, of generosity of our God. Let us continue in worship. Lord, we thank you for your church founded upon your word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depends on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. 
Help us to walk together. Pray together. Sing together. And live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the reign of our Lord and of our God. We pray.
This is Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, There is no help for you in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Rise up, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people.
So grateful for our ensemble, for our praise team and our choir working together and collaborating with that uh, lifting up of uh, the, the, such an important anthem, uh, the, the Black National Anthem for this day, and uh, a hymn that speaks to us and resonates with us in this moment afresh. Uh, Thank you for doing that, choir and musicians. We appreciate you for leading us in worship. Let us bow in prayer together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I pray this all in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus. Amen. Well, this week, I shared an interview on my Facebook feed featuring Capitol Hill police officer Michael Fanone, who was attacked and thrown to the ground in the middle of the violent mob on January 6th. For several long minutes, he was at the mercy of a crowd that had been whipped into a frenzy. I know we saw the images and the video. We've seen them over and over again who were at the Capitol to halt the election process of our country. After the crowd had tased him several times, after they had ripped his ammunition and his radio from him, he said in the interview, some guys started getting a hold of my gun and they were screaming out, kill him with his own gun. Kill him with his own gun. I want us to sit in that harrowing image this morning as we continue to think about how we might pray in this violent, divided time in which we live. I invite us to linger in, in the officer's account because in that crowd, no doubt, were many people fueled by rage, conspiracy theories, and falsehoods who would probably claim to be Christian, to follow Jesus. Some of them even had banners waving in the air that said, Jesus saves or Jesus is Lord. And yet there in that crowd, they called for blood. They were ready to take matters into their own hands. Now last week I closed my sermon on Jonah's prayer from chapter 2 with a quote attributed to St. Ignatius. But the truth is, no one exactly knows who wrote it, and there is plenty of theological debate around the phrase. The phrase goes like this, Pray as though everything depended on God. Act as though everything depended on you. And while on the surface, I think that maxim challenges us to never substitute prayer uh, for action alone, let's be real that we live in a world where for many people of faith, Disconnecting our actions and our beliefs are the norm. Scholar J.P.M. Walsh writes about this maxim. Sometimes it is used in such a way that it is virtually interchangeable with the saying, God helps those who help 
themselves. I'm sure you've heard that. And by the way, that is nowhere in the Bible. In this view, faith is private and personal. And God is ready to bless you when you solve your own problems by getting a job, starting a 401k, becoming a millionaire, or heck, overthrowing a democratically elected government. In other words, this idea that can seep into how we understand faith, especially in this country, is that we should pray to God for help privately, but we should be the answer to our own prayer publicly. In other words, just like the crowd that day, we should be ready to take matters into our own hands. My gut is that this is a pervasive problem in an American spirituality and this consumeristic culture in which we live. We may say we believe in God, but our actions reveal that we believe in ourselves and our institutions first. We don't even have to be radicalized in partisan politics or apocalyptic messages or cryptic conspiracy theories. Though we may pray that God is our help, even in times of trouble, we act like it is our bank accounts, our bylaws, our insurance, and our own determination that will deliver us from the challenges that we face. But there will be a time, and there always is, when we will face a situation so dire that no board action, no credit card, no lifeline will deliver us from what we face. On a personal level, this is so true when we struggle with addiction, when our relationships are falling apart, when we face unimaginable setbacks. We learn that there are moments when we cannot do it alone. We can't take things into our own hands. We need help. And maybe this is true for right now, where, for where we are as a nation. No matter what you feel about the next incoming presidential administration or Congress, let's be honest. They are not capable of delivering us alone from our long history of violence and injustice in this country. No matter their lofty ideals or the amount of hard work they put, we are sick as a country from a pandemic that's out of control and from the sin of white supremacy. So are we on our own? Is it all up to us? Or do we have someone who we can turn to for help. This morning, Psalm 3 gives us a potential answer. It begins in a place just like where Officer Fanon was on January 6th, stuck in the midst of a violent mob who are threatening to kill. In fact, a little note at the beginning of Psalm 3, it may be in your Bible if you want to follow along, indicates that this could have been prayed by King David when his own son, Absalom, betrayed him and threatened to kill him forcing David to flee. Our passage begins, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. This prayer opens with complete hopelessness and desperation. Evil and danger and conspiracy are all around. The psalmist is outnumbered. The odds are stacked against him. And even his enemies are taunting his belief in God. No one is coming to save you. God's not going to help you. As always, I appreciate the honesty of the Psalms as an ancient prayer book in the Bible because they give us permission to lay out our situation to God anytime we feel helpless and hopeless. God is listening. And like any good, honest relationship, we are invited to put it all out there, to air out our dirty laundry, if you will. Do you think God doesn't already know how hopeless and helpless you feel? In life, our journey to fullness, to wholeness, to a better life often begins with honesty, being honest to ourselves and with others. By telling the truth, how can we repair broken relationships and overcome our great setbacks if we do not turn and face them with clarity? 
So even with God, we are invited to be honest. When we are unable to be real, it is as if the enemies who taunt us have already won. Imagine if the prayer ended right there in that opening couple of verses. It would be like David had agreed with his enemies. You're right, there is no help for me in God. But rather than give in to the message of distrust, the psalmist shifts to a new tone full of confidence. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. Even in hard times, the psalmist believes and understands that God is our protector. God is at our side, prepared to ward off blows of the enemies and lift up our head when we are too weak to go on. The psalmist goes on to claim that God is even there when he lies down and when he rises up, when he sleeps through the night. God is that sustaining force that walks with him and is with him through the anxious and fearful nights of his life when he probably should be tossing and turning, afraid of all which, which is set against him. Now this image hits home for me in many ways because I have prayed for so many of you when you have uh, gone back in the hospital for surgery, for a procedure. And one of the things I have learned to say over the years that you may have heard me if you were paying attention, is how uh, to, to take your hands in that moment, to circle in hands and remind, remind each of you who are preparing for surgery, to remind your family and your loved ones that you are in good hands. Not just the hands of expert doctors and nurses and health professionals, but in the hands of a loving God, so that even when you drift off under anesthesia, you are really resting deeply in God's caring, trustworthy arms. So the psalmist gives us this image of strength, even in a moment of terror. And the psalm turns from lament and fear into one of reassurance and defiance. The message of the world that God is not to be trusted. God will not save you. They are false. Instead, God is there all along shielding and holding us. This confidence leads to boldness in the final section of the prayer. Rise up, O Lord. Deliver me, O God. Strengthened by remembering God's faithfulness, even in the tender, vulnerable moments of sleep, the prayer shifts to demands. These are not polite or timid demands. Rather, they tie us back to the beginning of the psalm. The psalmist needs help now. Danger is unfolding all around. This prayer is urgent. God, you need to do something. And I love how the language even goes to God. Punch evil in the face. Break the teeth of my enemies. The psalmist is ready for God to move in action Psalmist needs help. He cannot solve this problem on his own. He cannot help himself in this situation. He must rely on God and trust that deliverance is on the way. And that's kind of the word of this psalm ends, this word deliverance. It's such, itself such a powerful spiritual word that we need to reclaim. It means to be rescued or set free. And ultimately, the deliverance the psalmist needs belongs to God. Only God can save him now. So it turns out, contrary to that little maxim that God helps those who help themselves, Psalm 3 tells us that God helps those who can't help themselves. What a word we need to hear, and maybe our country needs to hear. This surprising and simple prayer gives us a new kind of language in this time in which we live. To pray with honesty and to pray with boldness for the enormous problems we face collectively and as individuals and families. Psalm 3 encourages those of us who, who battle demons that can appear insurmountable, like addiction or chronic health challenges, to take our struggles directly to God. Psalm 3 pushes back against the quick fix-it culture in which we live, which suggests every problem is a home remedy away. Instead, Psalm 3 tells us 
grounds us that there are some things that we cannot do apart from God. We need that higher power on our side. We need help. Being a faithful Christian means asking for help. Just like David may have done, just like the psalmist has done. What would it look like if we became a body of faith known not for helping others, but for teaching others how to receive help to transform our lives? What if we put away for once our lofty ideas that we can fix everyone else, and lots of churches have that idea, don't you know? And let's get busy letting God fix our broken and shattered lives. Hmm. Maybe we'd find more of those broken people in our world, the drunks and the sex workers and the poor and the bitter, hanging out with us from time to time, just like they did with Jesus. What if our worship and our prayers sounded like Isaac Bashiva Singer, who, who wrote, I only pray when I am in trouble. I am in trouble all the time. Perhaps you know what it's like to be in trouble all the time. On January 6th in D.C., in the midst of the violence and carnage of that day, I think we witnessed again how much trouble we are in. The values and sins on display were not new. They are old as the practice of slavery on these shores, of restrictive immigration laws, of violence by white men and women in hoods, by laws that create a separate but not equal paradigm, far too often the norm for people of color in our country. It is the same legacy that wants to mix, to wrap the, America, the Bible in the American flag and justify the, the brokenness of a nation with God. The sin of white supremacy is deeply rooted in our country's history, and it won't be easy to cleanse ourselves and create something new. Too often we have fooled ourselves into thinking that we can end racism if we all just try to be really, really nice to each other. If we just take matters into our own hands. But I wonder if once again, on the eve of a next inauguration and a new presidential administration, if God is inviting us Christians to our knees in prayer so that we too can join with the psalmist facing these what seem like insurmountable problems with the words, rise up, O Lord, deliver us, O Lord. Of course, on this weekend, we remember one of the people God sent to help us, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King is often remembered for his I Have a Dream speech, but Dr. King also fiercely resisted giving in to the helplessness of our present age. He sought to challenge us to never let the status quo remain unchallenged, but organized and led others into the midst of violent and angry mobs like what we witnessed last week to dismantle that which was killing his people and killing the soul of this country. He refused to give in to a narrative that said we all must be a little bit nicer, but saw that we must change the way we operate, the way the systems and institutions of this country are embedded with white supremacy and injustice. And only then could we potentially be free. His spirituality and his trust in God moved him into action. He would say, on one hand, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And then he would say, the moral arc of the universe is long and it bends toward justice, suggesting the audacious thought that God was working deliberately and determinedly to bring wholeness to a messed up creation. Such courage and faith kept Dr. King and his co-conspirators for justice, marching and singing and dreaming of what might be possible. Their witness was considered by some to be impossible, and yet their faith awash in God's help, assured of God's help, moved our whole country further 
and to the vision of the beloved community and a society where all are valued. The good news, friends, is then that God does help those who can't help themselves. God is never going to leave it entirely up to us, but we certainly must continue to do our part to march and sing and work faithfully to live the gospel good news that we have experienced and found in Jesus through whom God delivered, saved our broken world. This morning then, I want to say to each of you who are watching, trusting that at least one of you is in a helpless situation where it feels like enemies are camped all around. God is ready to help you. God is already aware of your situation. Reach out with honesty and pray this day. Ask for the help you need. God is listening. And for the rest of us, as we face another uncertain week, which promises potential violence and disruption and division, may we drop to our knees. May we ask for God's mercy and God's aid in this time. And then with strength, equipped by God as our shield and our protector, may we rise and march and dismantle the injustices and sins that have kept us from loving each other fully for far too long. And so I wanted to reword where I began that little maxim that I closed last week. I want to reword it a little bit. Maybe it's a little more relevant as we have thought about Psalm 3 together. Pray as though everything depended on God and act as though everything also depended on God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Taken from an article entitled The Purpose of Education, written by Dr. King in the Morehouse College student newspaper, the Maroon Tiger in 1947. The nonviolent approach does not immediately change the heart of the oppressor. It first does something to the heart and souls of those committed to it. It gives them new self-respect. It calls up resources of strength and courage that they did not know that they had. Finally, it reaches the opponent and so stirs his conscience that reconciliation becomes a reality from the book Stride to Freedom about the Montgomery bus boycotts and fight to end segregation. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Written by Dr. King in the letter from Birmingham City Jail, 1963. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. From the I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C., August the 28th, 1963, delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. We must be concerned not merely about who murdered them, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophies which produced the murders. From the eulogy for the martyred children, 1963, delivered at the funeral service for three children killed in the Birmingham church bombing. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. 
from Dr. King's Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, Oslo, Norway, 1964. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. From a sermon on March 8th, 1965. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. From the I've been to the mountaintop speech, April 3rd, 1968, delivered in Memphis, Tennessee, before he was assassinated. Thank you for thank you for our readers for sharing um, and participating in that powerful remembrance of words that still prick us and challenge us from Dr. King. In fact, I appreciate the honesty that Dr. King was able to have and speak throughout his ministry. And I appreciate the honesty of the Psalms that we read and give us language for how we might pray. And finally, then, I invite us to consider, as we come to this table, this communion table today, to recognize the gift of honesty at this most sacred moment in our worship, a time when we can come and sit at the table with Jesus to receive the gifts of bread and cup and be honest, to be honest with our Lord and Savior about where we have fallen short about where we need help, about where we can do better. So bring whatever it is that you are wrestling with, whatever it is that is burdening you down this time, whatever it is that you need help with, and offer it to God, receiving in return the gift of God, of his body and blood nourishment for us to endure to thrive even in hard times. For we remember on the night on which Christ was betrayed there in the upper room with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In a like manner later in the supper, Christ took the cup and he blessed it and he shared it with his disciples saying, take and drink each of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Wherever you are in your journey with Christ, know that you are welcome to share in this sacred feast using whatever elements you have available in your home or wherever you are right now. Or just know that we are holding you in prayer as we share in this sacred time. Let us bow for prayers over the bread and the cup. Blessings on the bread. Let us pray. Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us sustenance to run the race before us. Lord, continue guiding and protecting us especially during this epidemic. Again, I pray for the jobless, the poor, and the needy. In your name, we pray. Amen. Pray with me. Paul says in Romans 3.25, 
God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. We are here at this table to remember Jesus this day, and we are grateful for the blood symbolized by this cup. Give us the courage demonstrated by Jesus to responsibly ask for forgiveness for those things we have done wrong and help us to know that they've been washed away by his blood. Wrap us in the comfort of the Holy Spirit that we may breathe in the breath of life and know that you are in our hearts always and everywhere. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. leaders here at our church. This is our blessing box. We, re we really need your help to keep it stocked. Here are some things we can put inside our blessing box. Cans, apple juice in boxes, milk in boxes, cereal, pasta, rice. Please come by and donate whatever, whatever you can. It will really help the community out. Thank you for all your love and support and spreading God's love. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Thank you, Emily, for reminding us of that new ministry of help and support uh, for neighbors in need. And uh, we continue to encourage you to Check out our website at uccmd.org. Follow us on Facebook to get the latest announcements and news. You can sign up for our email list using our contact form at our website. It's a real simple form. And we'd love 
to, to reach out to you, to pray for you, to support you if, if we can. So send us a little note. Today at 3 o'clock is our regional Martin Luther King Jr. celebration service. You will hear some familiar sounds in that uh, and, and see some familiar faces in that service at 3 o'clock. All you have to do is go to cccadisciples.org to sign up and um, they will send you the link for the Zoom meeting. It is online so it's all safe and secure from home. Also later this month we're very excited to invite everyone out to our Go Act service, our, sorry, our Go Act retreat, which is what's formerly called Go Act. We are now renaming it to Vision at the Intersection. This is on Saturday morning, uh, on January 30th, we're going to gather and we are going to plan and dream of our future story. We're very excited to unveil our future story, so please sign up to be a part of that important event. You'll see, continue to see the RSVP form go out over our email in the coming weeks. So we close in prayer. And I do invite you, I saw earlier Jean asked for prayers for her, her boyfriend Dave. He contracted COVID this week. And so we pray for Dave that he will be strengthened and whole in this difficult time. We pray for peace among our communities and among our people, O oh God. We pray for those who are needing help that this world cannot provide. Help from you, O oh Lord. We pray for those who are grieving, especially the Pekaskis, and uh, uh, with the loss of their daughter Mary, we hold you with comfort and love, knowing how difficult and difficult this time is for you. We pray for our country in this time of transition that we may pray, that we may listen, that we may seek this opportunity to turn over a new leaf and move in a new direction together. And we know it's such a time of division and hurt. We pray for that this weekend might be a time on and not a day off, that tomorrow, as we remember the legacy of Dr. King, that we may recommit ourselves to the work to dismantle injustice and oppression in our midst, to make this world more free and beautiful for everyone. I think those are all the prayers that I have seen and lifted up in our chat. So grateful for each and every one of you for being here. And I know I'm praying for you. If there's anything we can do to support you, let me know how we can do that, what we can do. I'm going to close with a prayer here. Let me, um, a prayer from Dr. King to send us out with words that he shared with us. Let us pray. Thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls, and minds. We have not loved our neighbors as Christ loved us. We have all too often lived by our own selfish impulses rather than by the life of the sacrificial love as revealed by Christ. We often give in order to receive we love our friends and hate our enemies. We go the first mile, but ne'er dare not travel the second. We forgive, but dare not forget. And so as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that history of our lives is the history of an eternal revolt against you. But thou, O God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we could have been but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know your will. Give us the courage to do your will. Give us the devotion to love your will. In the name of Spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go in peace, beloved.